thanks. Uh, as, as Spencer <coughs> said, this is, uh, this is a slightly different way of, uh, of presenting. I'm Joe Twyman, the Director of Political and Social Research at YouGov, and I'm going to talk about the different types of, uh, of surveys that are conducted on, uh, on international aid and how you can perhaps view these critically uh, when you approach the data. I'd like to start with a uh, picture of a woman in a bikini. Um, here's a picture of a woman in a bikini. Here's another picture of a woman in a bikini. And you may be wondering, well, why am I showing you two pictures of women in bikinis? The reason for that is this, because the iconic scene in the 1962 Bond movie in which a stunning Honey Rider emerges from the surf singing to herself has been voted the most, expe ex most inspiring bikini moment in history. A survey for LipoBind found that Andrews' curves were an inspiration for their beach body diet, and it was only after taking LipoBind and exercising that Katie Hill, former Blue Peter presenter, pictured in the first picture, went from size 16 to a size 10, and that's from the Daily Mail in August 2008. Um, you may be wondering why I'm showing you this. It's an extreme example, admittedly a very extreme example, of a survey that is used to generate publicity, and it's not intended to provide insight into people's dieting, simply that. Before you think, well, the Daily Mail could be fooled very easily, so indeed could the Daily Mirror, uh, the Daily Telegraph, Daily Telegraph again, and uh, the Daily Telegraph for the third time. For more information, visit LipoBind. These are designed to generate publicity. Uh, they're not designed to generate insight. And you may be thinking, well, what's this got to do with, uh, with serious polling? These are uh, quite clearly not methodologically rigorous. Well, people quite often conduct methodologically rigorous surveys in order to generate publicity. To give you an idea, this is uh, the question that we ask at YouGov about abortion and the limits on abortion, which is currently a political, uh, political issue. Uh, currently, abortions are only legal up until the 24th week of pregnancy, except for cases of severe disability. Do you personally believe that that the period during the winter uh, uh, remain at 24 weeks, or should it be changed? And so we ask people, should the limit be changed? And then we ask, well, should it go up or down, depending on whether they specify that it should be changed? And 46% uh, say, uh, say they favor a decrease in the time limit for abortion. So that's one way of asking. This is the way that another agency, not YouGov, asks a question about abortion to generate publicity. The difficulty is that this was then used to produce, in inverted commas, insight. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, when you mention dead babies repeatedly in a survey, 72% say they favor a decrease. So, which is the right answer? Well, they're both right answers because they respond to the information that is provided to them. What you're doing is testing people's responses to a specific narrative. And so what we always advise people to do, sorry, I'll come back to that. What we always advise people to do is uh, get a clicker that works, is to ask the following questions when analyzing any kind of data. But this is particularly true for overseas development aid and other such contentious issues. Firstly, ask who commissioned the polling. Ask who is asking the question, so which agency is involved. Ask what questions they are asking. Look at the full question wording and also the context in which it's being asked. Ask how they're asking the questions. In other words, <coughs> is it being done over the phone, over the internet, face-to-face, self-completion perhaps. Who is answering the questions? What's the profile of people? Is it representative of the UK as a whole? How many people are answering? How is the data being analyzed? Is something that was consciously and deliberately a campaigning poll being shall we say, stretched to provide, uh, to provide greater, deal, uh, greater detail and insight, and how are the results being reported, which is the, uh, which is the same point. Um, I, would, uh, I would also caution you to remember Twyman's Law. Now, Twyman's Law is not actually something I came up with. Uh, Terry Twy no, sorry, Tony Twyman, the media researcher, invented Twyman's Law, but increasingly I'm of the opinion that I could have come up with it. Uh, so I'm passing it off as my own. Uh, and that's that anything that looks interesting or unusual is usually wrong. <laughs> so, uh, so keep that in mind. This is particularly true, and all this is a particular problem when it comes to just agree-disagree statements. They're quite often used for publicity purposes, and they are very good at testing responses <coughs> to very specific narratives. But they do not provide greater insight other than that. To give you an idea... Uh, if you ask people the government should increase public borrowing and f uh, any further 
should not increase public borrowing any further. Its top priority should be to pay off the nation's debt. 74% of people agree with that. Uh, but they also agree with the government should borrow more in the short term to increase economic growth. 49% of people agree with that. So you have, contradictory, uh, you have contradictory messages on occasion when you ask agree-disagree statements. It's not that either one is wrong, it's that you're measuring responses to specific narratives. And uh, to give you an idea of how extreme that can get, this is a question uh, we ran for uh, essentially for fun. Uh, Britain should leave the European Union but maintain close trading links. 55% of people agree with that. <coughs> and then we also asked Britain should remain a full member of the European Union. 55% of people <laughs> agree with that. Uh, and it, it really highlights that simply by running um, agree disagree statements, and we know why people do them, because they're cheap and they're fast and uh, newspapers love them, doesn't provide you necessarily the kind of insight that you need. On to the subject then of overseas aid. Um, we've already dealt with, uh, uh, Spencer looked at the, um, some of the data that you guys looked at. We've actually been involved in a great deal of uh, very detailed research for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, uh, and I'm going to present just three very quick findings from that. The first of these is to do with the question wording of, um, of the question of is too much, too little, or about right being spent, and this plays on Spencer's point about the way it was presented um, in the Comrades survey. We don't know the best way to present this data, and so we presented it as a split sample. Half the respondents, and there were over 5,000 respondents in each of the four countries in which we ran this, half the respondents were given this question. The, go uh, the gov British government currently allocates eight and a half billion pounds. We think it's too little, too much, or about right. And the other half were given this question. The British government allocates 0.57% of Britain's income to overseas aid each year. Do you think this is about, uh, it's too little, too much, or about right? So two different things. We, we estimate that the first is, if you like, the worst way of presenting <coughs> it. The second one is the best way. And this is what we found. Clearly, there's a difference there. Which one is correct? They're both correct because they're both looking at responses to specific things. Where does, if you like, the true answer lie? Probably somewhere in between the two. What's the overall story? A lot of people think that too much, aid, uh, too much money is being spent on aid by the government. And then, uh, picking up again on, uh, on Spencer's point, we also, uh, we also did some key driver analysis explaining people's view, looking to rather, explain people's uh, current views on international aid, and then also looking at how you could change that. In order to do that, we, uh, we worked with some, uh, some academics from the University of Texas at Dallas to do principal component analysis and derive factors from the following statements. For those of you don't, that don't speak survey geek, what that mm -hmm. essentially means is that we combine each of these into broad themes. So the broad theme of morality, the broad theme of benefits, the broad theme of costs, the broad theme of e the economic situation. And then when you, uh, when you run ordinal probit models, again, ignore the, uh, ignore the, uh, the polling geekery, what you find is this. The R squared value that's represented is essentially an estimate of the percentage that someone's attitude towards increasing or decreasing aid can be explained by these different general themes. And as you can see, it's morality that is the most, this is uh, for the UK, though I do have the results for, uh, for Britain, Germany, and the US as well. Um, this, this shows that morality explains approximately 60% of, uh, of that, and the cost-benefit calculation that people make, in other words, the rational choice benefits outweighing the costs, uh, can be used to explain 56%. Once you composite all that up together, you get around about 67% in total. Income, economic evaluations, and socio-demographics only make up, uh, when you control for other factors, only make up a small portion of that. That explains where, uh, where people's views are at the moment. If you want to change their views, then we looked at, uh, at simulations increasing people's, uh, increasing people's views on benefits and cost morality, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and then estimated the probability <coughs> that increase, uh, that Th sorry, we estimated the probability that a respondent would increase their, uh, their view on aid when you varied these different elements from their minimum to their maximum. And we found that if you combined the cost-benefit analysis and morality, you stood a 094 94% chance that they would be more positive about aid as a result. And that was significantly higher than individual elements. Benefits and costs were certainly the most significant of the, uh, the individual themes, 
morality, although it explains more, is not so important in driving uh, key evaluations. But in the unlikely event that, uh, that me rabbiting on about the different types of questions has not bored you senseless, I can very much recommend the introduction to survey design at the Essex Summer School in Social Science and Data Analysis, uh, not just because I give it, but also because it does provide a helpful, uh, helpful way of uh, looking at these things in more depth. And if you'd like more information about the survey specifically that we and the other work that we've done on international aid, my email address here is here, as is my Twitter handle. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm desperately trying to beat the person who sits next to me at work.